Christ is my firm foundation. He is the rock on which I stand when everything around me is shaken. I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. Cause he's never let me down. He's faithful through generations. So why would he fail now? He won't.
just want to speak the name of Jesus yeah. over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Every dark addiction starts to break. Yes, come on now. Declaring there is hope and there is freedom. Yeah, I speak Jesus. Because your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name
All of the great things you did When did I throw away faith for the impossible? Come on, church. How did I start to believe You weren't sufficient for me Why do I talk myself out of seeing miracles? You do miracles. You are more than able. You are more.
He's gonna move. If you believe that, will you raise your hands? Come on, let's sing. With all of the faith in it, we will know what the Lord can do. What the Lord can do. It is gonna happen. Just let the way make it through. He's gonna move. He's gonna move. So can you imagine with all of the faith in the room what the Lord can do? What the Lord can do? It's gonna Just let the way make it through. He's gonna move. He's gonna move.
Come on, church. Let's go to the Lord in prayer together at this time. Father, we love you. And we are so thankful that we have been forgiven. God, that, that your sacrifice provides us opportunity. And Lord, I'm so thankful for that. God, I pray that as you've been with us in our worship, that you continue to be with us throughout the rest of this evening. And Lord, we give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Um, I was supposed to do this on the front end, and, and, and I forgot. And so I want to make sure that I do this properly. Um, I have been on staff now with General Baptist for three years three years, uh, three or four years close to it, it feels like, maybe. Um, and in my time there, I, I was able to come into headquarters a little bit around the same time that Dr. Danny did. And um, we came in together, and there in those early days, a lot of times it was just myself and Danny and Miss Carol sitting in the office. And I got to hear a lot of what Danny's heart was for the movement, for General Baptist. And I said, Danny, I'm, I'm somewhat new to the denomination, and so if you'd share with me what, what you're feeling. And, and it was very quickly he began to share that we as the headquarters, we as the, that office need to be about the church. We need to be for the church. And I've heard him reiterate that over and over and over and over and over and over again. As a pastor of a church, I understand casting vision and how important it is, but I also understand as a Christian, how vital it is to be able to follow a vision. And Dr. Danny has done that. He has placed a vision before us as a people, as a group, as a body, that we are for the church. And it's not just for headquarters. It should be each and every one of us as pastors and leaders that we are for the church. The church is what Christ is coming back for. And we should be for it at all costs. And so at this time, I'd be honored to introduce to you Dr. Danny Dunneman, as he comes and brings the word to us tonight. Love you, brother. Love you, brother. <clears throat> uh, I would invite you to stand with me, if you would, for the reading of God's word. Um, I always like to let God have the first word. For Mark chapter 8, verse 34. And then he called the crowd to him, along with his disciples. And said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. And then from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 21 and 22. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am. I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Almighty God, you're the one who spoke the world into existence. You're the one who spoke to Abraham, who spoke to Isaac, who spoke to Jacob. You gave them promises and you kept them. Lord, you're the one who spoke to Moses out of a burning bush. You're the one who spoke the words of the law as the mountains smoked and the earth shook. You're the one who spoke to your people through leaders and prophets, guiding, comforting, chastening, and judging them. And you're the one who spoke on hillsides and at the edge of lakes to crowds of people thirsting for a word with power and authority. You're the one who spoke to disciples and to lepers, to Pharisees and to the outcast, to Pilate and to Mary. God, you are a God who speaks the very words of life. So tonight, Lord, we are a people who are thirsty again for a fresh word from you. Lord, these folks didn't come here tonight to hear me. They didn't come to the summit because they needed words from some other human being about their ministry. Lord, they came because they need to hear from you. So, Lord, speak to us. Open your word among us tonight. And, Lord, give us the grace to receive it and to obey what you say. Lord, speak for your glory and for our good. In Jesus' name. 
You can be seated. Thank you. So last year at the summit in Evansville, I opened my sermon there with the line, the population of hell will be greater because Christians don't respond to God's call to ministry. And during the last year, we have asked that our churches focus on praying for God to call people to the ministry and for our churches to intentionally focus on calling for at least one Sunday in part of the events for their year. So if you weren't here for the business session yesterday or haven't heard this, here's the result of that challenge. Since the summit last year, 97 individuals have accepted God's call to vocational ministry among General Baptist churches. What's amazing is that we actually started with the goal of 30. And as the year progressed, and we heard the stories of people in churches all over, we were amazed at what God was doing. We moved that goal once, we moved it twice, and we still went past it in the end. We heard stories of churches with several young people in that church, all of them under the age of 18, multiple of them who said yes to callings, to be worship leaders, to be pastors, to be missionaries. You know, back in the spring, I also, uh, another example, I got to go and attend an evening service in Kentucky. Uh, Pastor John Kirby, who spoke this morning during the 4 by 10 at his church in, in Clifton, at Clifton General Baptist Church outside Scottsville, t- uh, Kentucky. And Brother Tracy Woods preached his first sermon that night. Man, that was great. He didn't know who I was. I was sitting in the back. Didn't want to make him nervous. But man, my heart was blowing up at what God was doing in that young man's life. It delighted me to see our team struggle to get the names of people so that we could provide encouragement, so that we could pray for them. It's been exciting to see this. And sometimes um, I, I get the sense that many Christians in the United States think that the best days of the church are behind us. But I'm excited about what God is going to do with this next generation of leaders. I think something special could be coming. I also know with confidence that Jesus promised that he would build his church, and he has never failed in a promise yet. Even with all that excitement, I have had this kind of nagging thought in the back of my head, though, and it's something we've talked about on our team, and we've talked about with a larger group of people that help us with strategic planning, but there's always, you know, this tendency that you could have that When you focus on something, just focusing on it makes it improve. You know that? It's in behavioral science. It's called the Hawthorne effect. The Hawthorne effect, it comes from a set of studies that was conducted at the Hawthorne Works factory back in the 1920s and 30s. And the Hawthorne effect says that individuals improve in some aspect of their behavior in response to awareness of being observed or to just simple attention. The worry is that progress can be temporary without sustained changes that underlie what is happening in that behavior. Sustained changes that result in a changing culture. So my worry is that the progress we've seen this last year is only because we're focusing on it. We're talking about it. It's in front of our minds. But here's the thing. Calling to ministry cannot be reduced to a temporary initiative. You see, developing leaders isn't an initiative. It's a culture. A culture rooted in, and here's the word, discipleship. Last night, Mac Lake mapped out the culture of leadership development rooted in discipleship and what that could look like. Wasn't that good? Wasn't what Mac shared good? There's a reason that we invited that guy to come and be a part of the event this year. We need to move beyond an answering the call initiative, and we need to grow a culture where leadership development is a natural outflow of how we understand, how we understand the very basics of what it is to do church. A culture of developing leaders needs to replace st- sporadic focus on calling to specific roles. 
I mean, we need pastors. All the data says this. We need pastors. We need church planters. Oh, how I wish we could have the church planters. We need missionaries. We need people to say yes to go to the mission field. All of those we feel pretty acutely. We need people to step up in the myriad of other roles that churches need to reach their communities with the gospel. And that need is there and it is still acute and is going to continue to be because, like I said last year, that's a generational struggle that we're in the middle of. However, more than anything, we need the church to be the church that it's supposed to be. An organism. Did you know the church is not a, an organization or an institution? It's an organism. It's a body that develops all parts so that it can grow to the fullness of the stature of Christ. That process is what we call discipleship. And the church can't be what it's called to be unless our understanding, unless our understanding of these two things, leadership and discipleship get lived out together in every aspect of what we do. You see, it is a mistake to separate church leadership from discipleship. When we separate the two, we end up with both, both weak and unbiblical leadership, and we end up with unformed disciples. And that's exactly what's happened over and over again in the history of the church. This isn't new for us, by the way. Uh, there's nothing new under the sun. I think that's written somewhere. At various times, being a Christian and being in the ministry in the church have been separated so that there are professional Christians. We sometimes call them pastors. And then there's everybody else, right? Besides being unbiblical, separating discipleship and the calling leads to a variety of problems in the church. First, it creates a major league and a minor league mentality where pastors are the only ones who do the ministry the only ones holy enough to do the ministry, that they're a special cast of Christians through whom the church finds its life. And this stunts the growth of the body because we only have a few who are doing the ministry. And then what happens is the ministry becomes a very small thing. I've talked about this in my sermons at the summit in both of the last two years. I worry that this is a besetting sin of ministry in our time. We think that professional pastors do the ministry, and that simply isn't what we find in the Bible. But besides creating burned out and blown out leaders, this separation of discipleship from ministry, the ministry of the church, also weakens the church itself. It creates a group of weak disciples who only find a gospel of cheap grace. The average Christian doesn't expect much of themselves because little is expected of them. I've heard that a lot. I was a, I was a professor for a long time. I had one of my students telling me how hard my class was out in the hallway a while ago. But in the church, what happens when we don't challenge people is that we have casual and lukewarm Christian living, and that becomes something that's just normal. We reduce discipleship to a class or a program in the church rather than to the entire work of the church. And, our, and then what happens is our gospel then isn't vir virulent enough to stave off even the most minor of assaults. Do you want to know why there's so much deconstruction of Christianity happening all around us in the American Christian landscape? It's because we have a bunch of unformed Christians running around with weak understandings of the gospel grown up in the context of lazy discipleship. Most people don't expect that they need to go very deep. After all, fully living out the gospel is something that pastors do, right? It's their job. It isn't really required of the rest of us. All of this over time results in church leaders who understand themselves to be on a higher plane and no longer know how to follow themselves. They see authority and success through the lenses of the world rather than through the lenses of the gospel. Leadership becomes more important even in their lives than following Jesus is. Because their identity is in their leadership rather than in the gospel. And before long, we get churches that are professional and respectable and prosperous. 
But they don't make real disciples anymore, not even of their leaders. And then we wonder why we don't have people responding to a call to ministry. We've made Christianity a watered-down process and put ministry and leadership development into two separate processes. Ministry that becomes separated from discipleship in the minds of the leaders and the non-leaders. And ministry becomes too high to attain for the average Christian to connect with. And they won't live it out in their lives. So I've thought a lot about this connection between calling and discipleship. And the two words that I keep coming back to, that I keep thinking about as the key to rightly understanding the entire calling conversation are these two words. Disciple and apostle. I want to unpack that a little bit for you. I would also say this. Last night, Mac got really close to doing what I'm about to do, and I was panicked for just a minute. (laughs) When he was finished, I was like, man, okay, I'm all right. But let's look at these two words and what they indicate both in the meaning and in the way they operate in the New Testament. First, let's look at the word disciple. The textbook definition of a disciple is this. A disciple, the Greek word is Methetes means a student, a learner, and follower of a master or teacher. It is one who learns to think and to act like the master teacher. Notice the disciple is more than just a collector of information. I mean, a disciple definitely has information. You can't know something without having some information. But that is just the beginning of things. A disciple walks behind the master and mimics the way that the master lives. So last night, Mac mapped out that process of development in the life of Jesus' disciples. He talked about the times and the levels and the interactions with the teacher. And these guys, they didn't just, look at, think about it, they didn't just download a little bit of content from Jesus. They followed him close enough so that they could be like him. They were learners in the deepest sense of that word. And as we look at the way Jesus discipled his original disciples, there are some things that are very clear. First, discipleship isn't accidental. It is intentionally formational. Jesus was intentional about the work and the lives of the disciples. There's a really good recent book on personal discipleship by John Mark Comer titled Practicing the Way. You haven't got this book, let me just recommend it to you. The book maps the process of how Jesus apprenticed, that's a word that he likes to use, apprenticed his disciples. The subtitle of that book clearly maps out the process. It involves, he says this, being with Jesus, becoming like Jesus, and then doing as Jesus did. Each step has components that are necessary for full discipleship. But if we aren't careful, we can accidentally make the gospel about just the first moments of a process like that. We can make it just about being with Jesus, about making a decision, about getting baptized, about building a personal quiet time, etc. We can mistake the initiation into the life of faith and as the whole of the faith. And I say that that's accidental because it's simply the easiest thing to measure. It's easy to just focus on what you can measure quickly. But our frustrations in the church, they're not usually caused by the initiation stuff, right? Usually caused when people don't do as Jesus did, which was part three of of that book. They don't live up to expectations. They don't demonstrate the gospel in their lives. They don't respond to a call from God. But we fail to see the connection to the fact that we are failing to do the thing in the middle. We are failing to help them to become like Jesus. We aren't intentionally discipling them to move beyond the basics. We don't do the spiritual formation work. We need to teach the habitual practice of submitting every thought and word and action. Every one of them. Every ambition and hope and dream, submitting every minute and dollar and gifting to the all to the purposes for which we have been called in Christ Jesus. That's the minimum of discipleship. That is hard work. It takes time. It takes effort and intentionally walking with people over years of time. And if you're finished with that journey in here, I would love to talk to you. But that's real discipleship. 
That leads to the second thing that is clear when we look at Jesus' method of discipleship. Discipleship isn't a mere program. It is the entire ministry of the church. Too many times we reduce discipleship to just a class, to just a course of study of some kind. We say that our discipleship is Sunday school or it's groups in our church. But that compartmentalization of discipleship is a foreign idea to what we see about discipleship in the scriptures. Jesus didn't tell the disciples to come to a small group. He said, come follow me. Discipleship isn't a program or a curriculum or a pathway to leadership. Church planter and author Dahadi Lewis says in his book, Among Wolves, disciple making is not a ministry of the church. It is the ministry of the church. Your church is in the business of making disciples. Full stop, you shouldn't be doing anything else. Your success is only measured by whether you're doing that. Not about how you feel when you walk in those doors. So do you see all of your activity in the church as being related to discipleship? If there are some things that you're expending significant energy on that are only marginally committed to that, maybe you should stop doing them. Thirdly, when we look at Jesus' way of discipleship, we see that discipleship isn't for me. Discipleship is about reorienting life so that it is lived for others. All of it. Man, this can be a hard pill to swallow. You know, maturing as a human being means figuring out that it isn't all about you. You see a baby, and I'm going to give this example because it's one that was used by uh, Augustine in church history like, you know, 1,700 years ago. He said, you look at a baby, you know what a baby is? It's all about itself, right? He said that meant that they were little sinners, by the way. If you have kids, you know that's true. (laughs) They have no other vision except for their own wants, their own needs. And slowly over time, that begins to change. Even in adolescence, though, young people are still working through that, right? You got any teenagers? Yeah, I heard three over here. (laughs) Lord be with you. Um. They're still working through that. Reaching a state of maturity is usually most obvious whenever you find someone who realizes that their life is not really about themselves. In our spiritual lives, in our discipleship, that's also true. Jesus said the authentic mark of his followers would not be that they loved him, but that they loved one another. Discipleship might then be summarized by being about reorienting life so that it's lived for others' good. And by good, I mean for their, if I could use some theological terms, for their salvation and sanctification. I think it's interesting that Jesus said that they would know us by our love for one another rather than our love for him. But here's a clue to that. It might be that our love for him is most clearly shown when we love one another. So look at the next text that I, uh, uh, look, so I w- next I want to look at that text that I read earlier from Mark chapter 8. Uh, if you don't get a point about this, the first text, it's about discipleship. The second one is about apostleship, okay? Mark 8, Jesus said that if you want to be his disciple, then you need to lay down your life like he did. You need to take up your cross. You need to suffer on it like he did. Because he did all of that, not for himself, but for us. That is, he also says in Mark, to give up his life as a ransom for many. You can't be a disciple if you're about yourself, if you're about your own development, if you're about your satisfaction, if you're about your comfort. I loved what Joyce talked about this morning. Wasn't that good? Pain is essential to leadership. That's so true. And if I could add to that just a little, it's part of leadership because it's part of discipleship. Sacrifice is what it looks like to be like Jesus. By the way, that's the whole point of the gospel of Mark, if you want to go find that out. But I said that my thinking on the topic of calling and discipleship has revolved around two words, and I've just talked about one. 
The second word is the logical outflow, though, of the first. So these guys that were called to be disciples ultimately get called apostles, right? So what does that mean, and why is it significant? Well, here is the textbook definition of an apostle. Apostle is apostolos, someone sent out with a mission or a message, an envoy or a delegate dispatched to convey a message. So literally, an apostle is a sent person. Think about it this way. If disciples are called to come and follow, apostles are called to go and tell. You see the symmetry of that? Even in the Gospels, the disciples are first called apostles when they are commissioned to go to the villages. They were disciples who were sent out to make more disciples. That's what an apostle is. And that's what also living out the way of Jesus and what that looks like. They learned from the master and like the master, they taught others to walk in the master's way. The gospels and acts drip with the connections between following Jesus and carrying forth his ministry. I mean, it's basically uh, everywhere. The obvious ones are those like, for example, at the end of, of Matthew in the Great Commission or in Acts 1 in the commission Jesus gives before the ascension there. But there are also m- multiple times in the Gospels where Jesus sends out a group of disciples to do the same kind of ministry he was doing, right? In some ways, we could even say that the book of Acts is pretty much just a demonstration that the disciples were doing what Jesus had taught them to do and trying to catch up with the, the Holy Spirit as he was dragging them through it. Their ministry, though, ended up looking like Jesus' ministry. But in all the texts that connect the ministry of Jesus to that of the apostles, I have to say, my favorite ones are the ones in the Gospel of John. If you know anything about the structure of the book of the Gospel of John, chapters 13 through 17 are all in one place. They're all in one scene, really. Sometimes it's called the upper room discourse or sermon, even though there's no mention of an upper room in, in John. Nearly 30% of John's gospel takes place in this one scene. It starts with him washing the disciples' feet, and it ends in chapter 17 with a prayer for his disciples, for his, about his glorification for his disciples, and his prayer ultimately even for us. And in between the beginning and ending, there are some powerful teachings, several of them, chapter 14, chapter 15, chapter 16, that deal with the coming of the Holy Spirit, that Jesus says will empower them to carry on his ministry. Did you know you have the Holy Spirit not for you, but for the work of ministry? And at one point he even says that they will do even greater things than him. Then after the crucifixion and the resurrection, we see that what happened in the text that I I read earlier from John chapter 20. Jesus says, as the Father has sent me, hear the word sent there, connection to apostolos. As the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. What's interesting is that in that text, the apostle that's there is Jesus. He's the apostolos, if you look at the original language. And then he breathes on them. And they receive the Holy Spirit. As the Father has sent me, so I'm sending you. And we have disciples that become apostles. And I don't think that those words of Jesus to those guys was intended to just be for them, right? He didn't just send them, but he was also sending us And giving us a paradigm for what happens in the life of every follower of Jesus, every disciple of Jesus. The role of being an apostle isn't nearly as important as the apostolic mission of the church. The apostolic mission of the church is to make more disciples just like Jesus did. And that is the role of every believer. It's not just for a few people, right? We are all sent to make disciples, just as we are all called to be disciples. They are two sides of the same thing. You were called to make disciples. Not just your church, not just your pastor, pastor, not just you. We are all called that. Another way of saying it is that 
being a disciple will always result in a calling to ministry. Something I learned a long time ago is that I'm not a better disciple than other disciples because I was called to be a pastor. That's bad theology, and it's just simply not true. Instead, I would say that my calling to this ministry has been a work of grace in my life that has kept me a disciple. I'm too weak of a disciple to have any other calling. God knows my heart, and so he has used the work of ministry that he has called specifically for to me to tether me to himself and to keep me a follower of him. For me, my calling is my way of discipleship, period. This is what it looks like for me to be a disciple. Those two things can't be separated. You can't be a disciple of Jesus and be disobedient to the call of God on your life. It simply is not possible for you to do that. And I'm afraid we constantly confuse the role of calling in its relationship to, for, to discipleship because we act like they're two different things. And we act like one of them is an obligation for every Christian to be a disciple. And that the other is some kind of optional thing only for those that are strong enough. That is baloney. There are, there are two sides of the same coin. Sending people into ministry is paramount to making disciples. It was for Jesus, and you're not greater than your master. Your church was not called, this is going to be harsh, your church was not called to collect disciples either. It was called to commission them and to make them disciples. And success in the ministry isn't seeing how many people you can collect into your building on Sunday morning. That's a pretty modern and non-biblical way of measuring faithfulness. The measure is not collecting. The measure is sending. If you're not sending people out from your church, if you're not commissioning disciple makers into your community and to the ends of the earth, then you might not be a church of Jesus Christ. I hear people talk all the time about kingdom mindset. Sending people out of your church, that's kingdom mindset. So stop feeling like you are a failure if you don't have a bunch of people in your church. Because you don't have as many as some other church down the road. The church I grew up in, my dad pastored there for a long time. We only ever had about 30 people. And multiple people in this room have been called to ministry out of that church. Stop feeling like you have it all together and you're fulfilling your mission if a lot of people show up at your church. That doesn't work for you either. Target sending. Just like Jesus. And the rest will take care of itself. So let me go just one step further in this. You are not called to collect leaders either in your church. I don't care how good your leadership culture is in growing leaders in your church. It isn't kingdom leadership if you aren't sending leaders outside your church. That one, ooh, pretty quiet. <laughs> but here's the crux of it all. Both of these things are equally true. Apostolic ministry is impossible without discipleship first. And disciples must become apostolic to be real disciples. I've loved the answering the call initiative and hearing about people called into ministry. One of the reasons it excites me is that the yeses that we have heard are evidence that churches are indeed making disciples and sending them out to do the work of ministry. But I don't want this to be a mere moment where we panic about needing leaders we get a bunch of them and then we forget about the entire context of leadership and calling and the mission of the church itself. This is about a culture thing, not a counting thing. So if you know me, you know that I like to ask questions. Not as much as Dustin Thompson. <laughs> if you know Dustin, you love him or not. But he asks a lot of questions. By the way, it's one of the reasons I love him on my team. Not everybody on the team loves that, but I do. 
But I, I like to ask the question, why? Why are we doing this? Why is calling important? Why is discipleship important? Why? Because you can't be faithful without challenging people to say yes to their calling to ministry because it is an essential element of making disciples. So if you want to make disciples and that's your calling, then you need to be asking them to be called to ministry and making pathways for them to do it and then sending them out. So what are your expectations? I just want to ask you to sit with the question tonight for just a minute. What kind of culture are you creating in your church? You may be the pastor, you may not be. You are all, we're all culture creators. Refocus on real discipleship that includes vocation for every Christian. That's something you can do to make a culture. Set the bar high when giving people steps that they need to get to being a disciple. Be intentional about developing followers of Jesus who expect to be sent. Tonight, there may be someone here who's thinking, I know my next step in discipleship is to say yes to God's call in my life. Maybe it's a call to a specific ministry. Maybe it's a call to missions. Maybe it's a call to pastoral ministry. Maybe it's a call to some other vocational ministry. Here in a moment, the band's going to come out and they're going to play. And if that is you, I want to invite you to come and let's pray. Maybe tonight you've been convicted because you've closed yourself off to a call from God. And you've maybe thought, well, I can still be a good church member. I can tithe. I can serve. You can't be a disciple if you don't say yes. You've maybe said, I won't do that. Would you be willing to come and to pray for God to soften your heart so that you could be a faithful follower of Jesus? Maybe you're a church leader and you want to commit to making sending and calling a central part of your church's culture. And that's an that's a hard, easy thing for me to say. It's really hard to do. Maybe you've treated it like something that is for a few people instead of for everyone. And maybe you need to just make a specific commitment to God in the way he's calling you to lead going forward. I invite you to come forward tonight too. Let's pray together. Let's other folks pray alongside you. I mean, we're going to be providing additional resources for making these kinds of things practical, but tonight, don't leave here without making a commitment to God to what he is asking from you right now. So as the band leads us right now, if God is laying it on your heart to come, be obedient to his voice. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are indeed the master disciple maker. And the path that you put forward for us, Lord, it is a good path. Not only that, it is the best path. Lord, forgive us whenever we try to figure out how to do this on our own. We think we're smarter than your, your way of doing it. We think we can program it. We think that we can bypass something. Lord, help us to trust you to trust your call, to trust your direction. Father, tonight, I pray for our churches. I pray, Lord, that they would have a passion to develop people, to send them out as fully developed disciples that would change the world. Lord, you did it with just a few people. Lord, forgive us when we think we have to have a ton. Lord, bless these churches tonight. And Lord, if there is someone who is here tonight, and they hear about calling and they've heard us talk about that, they've heard uh, other people having conversation about what's going on, 
Lord, you're dealing with their hearts. I pray tonight, Lord, you would give them a grace to just say yes to what's right in front of them right now. Lord, give them the grace to trust that just the next yes. Lord, you don't, they don't have to have it all figured out right now. They just need to be able to say yes to you right now. Please, Lord, move their hearts. Help them to say yes. Put people around them that can help that yes bear fruit in their lives so that they can find what they were meant to be here for. Lord, I pray that in these moments that you would move. And Lord, I pray you would hear our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
You are great. And we glorify you. And we lift up your name above all names. Because only you are worthy of our praise. Only you are worthy of our worship and our adoration. Father, we glorify you. So church, let's sing that one more time. Let's just lift up with the voices. How great is our God. Sing with me. How great is our God. Oh, let's sing how great, how great is our God. Come on, one more time, sing. the guy for it is Andy Mathias. Andy and I knew each other, not as well as we do now, but I knew him to be a man who was a leader, who had a heart for General Baptist people, and would do things the right way. And uh, like I said, it was a genius idea. Andy has served us so faithfully. I can't tell you the burdens that he has borne for all of us. I all sometimes have said, and by his stripes, I have been healed. And so when we were beginning to think about who could be a moderator for this event, and we've been thinking about the moderator's job, and it's changing a little bit over time here. You could probably see that. And uh, Andy understand, understood that. He was willing to, to serve. And so I wanted to give him this opportunity to do this. Also, as an opportunity to honor him so you could honor him. And so I, I get the opportunity now to just give you a plaque, which doesn't mean a whole lot other than it comes with all of our hearts. Reverend Andy Mathias for outstanding service as moderator of the 154th annual session of the General Association of General Baptists convened at Gallatin, Tennessee, July 18th through the 20th, 2024. I love you, brother. Before we 
get away from this place, I, I want to pause for just a few minutes and say some thank yous. This has been a, a difficult transition sometimes, but also exciting, encouraging, and inspiring. And I appreciate the confidence that's been placed in me and uh, the responsibility that's been put on me in some situations. But it comes with a cost. And, and first off, I want to thank my family, yeah. especially my wife. Um, it takes a lot of travel and a lot of time. And I appreciate the sacrifice that she and my boys have made and my church family as well. This it's not uncommon for me to call one of our deacons and say, you got to teach Wednesday, I'm going to be gone to Poplar Bluff again. And they always uh, cover the gaps, and I appreciate them. I want to thank the staff at headquarters at General Baptist Ministries, especially if you were here for the business, you, you'll understand Brother Carol <laughs> and, and Chris, <laughs> the, the work they've done for the General Association to make this happen but all the staff and the tremendous job they do. I want to, stay, want to thank Freedom Church, Pastor Terrell especially. Um, I, I've been going to the General Association since it was still just the General Association before the summit existed. And this is the first time we've been back in a church for a long time. And it was different and it was exciting and it was new and I appreciate the effort that they put forth not only Pastor Terrell their worship team their church staff brother Tim does a whole lot of stuff I appreciate what all he's done and, and also all their volunteers and I want to say again thank you to them and and not only them last year as we announced all this one of, one of the greatest feelings I had was Pastor Jason at Centerpoint came up to me and the first thing he said is, we are available for anything y'all need. And, and what a, just a servant's heart their church has had. And I want to say a special thank you to Centerpoint as well for agreeing to do whatever. They said they'd come here and take out the trash or do whatever they needed to do to be able to help. And I appreciate their church and, and their heart as well. And, and finally, I, I've grown up in this uh, body of believers and I count it a, a privilege to, to be here to have been raised up by a lot of you by the examples that you've set and I just want to thank you thank you for being faithful and for being here for taking time out of your schedule because it's not always easy sometimes it comes with sacrifice I know a lot of people took vacations and and all sorts of other things that they had to sacrifice time with family or work to be here. And I want to encourage you, continue to do that. Invite, encourage others back home to have your church family. I'm looking forward to next year. And the final thank you I want to share. We hold this for me, Brother Terrell. Final thank you I want to say is thank you to Jim. <laughs> because my time is up. Before you do that, before I'm going to roll a video when you give that to him. So hold on a second. I just want to add a, th a thank you to Brother Terrell, too. Uh, if you could just, let's stand and give Freedom a round of applause. They have been terrific for us. I love you. Love you, brother. Thank you so much for doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, my name is Clint Cook. And I'm Blake Thomas. And we are so excited to invite General Baptist back to Springfield, Illinois, to Real Life Church. Hey, we are ready to host you all in 2025. Our facilities have a cafe with great coffee and breakfast items for you guys. Our children's program area is top notch. And so we're going to host the kids program in a very comfortable and functional place. We have a worship center and worship band that's ready to lead us in all of our worship services and gatherings. Anything else? Mm, bathrooms? Hey, here in Springfield, we have lots of great activities for you and your family to do. If you like Abraham Lincoln, we have the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Museum. We also have Knights Action Park, and then we also have Shields, which is a huge sporting goods store. 
And hey, if you like Abraham Lincoln, we have Abraham Lincoln's home. If you're into restaurants, we got a wide assortment that you'll have a, a wide choice of different restaurants to be able to choose. And hey, if you like Who Abraham Lincoln, uh, we also have Abraham Lincoln's tomb. And who knows, you might actually get a chance to meet the real Abraham Lincoln. Hello, hi Abraham Lincoln. So I hear you're coming to my hometown. See the many sights, the library and museum, my home, the place where they... Okay, Summit folks, we are so excited that you're getting to come to Springfield, Illinois in 2025, July the 17th, 18th, and 19th. We want you to join us. We're praying for you. You don't want to miss. We'll see you there. Amen. Give my hand. <laughs> I have only one official act to do, and that is that I need a motion from the floor that we adjourn the 2024 summit and that we pick up next year in Springfield, Illinois. Is, is there a motion? Is there a second? All of you that are in favor, stand. Wow. They all want to go home. Now, I'm supposed to pound this thing, and the only wood that I've got is here. So I'll make sure this gets, this is Bononi Stinson's, by the way. So we, no, not really. Let me leave you with these words of wisdom. I had an old Methodist pastor that I loved to death who kind of helped mentor me along the way. And he used to say this, if this didn't light your fire tonight, your wood is wet. Amen. Go home. Have a blessed night.